Welcome back. I'm going to ask you a question. What is the number one cause of death in the United States? Sorry, I apologize if it's not Canada, but most of our statistics tend to mirror each other. Heart disease, but even though it is true, it is heart disease, the next edition of the CDC, which is the Centers for Disease Control in my country, is going to show that it is cancer. Now, why would you suppose that our number one killer has now traded places? What do you think is happening? Because I can tell you the cancer death toll has gone up steadily from the early 1900s. Yes, yeah, some people have said, well, maybe it's because we're living longer. If everyone lives to 80 or 90, they get cancer. Now, I've actually heard some physicians say, yeah, all men, if they live long enough, will get prostate cancer. Yeah. I've heard some physicians say that. And so could it be that we're living longer? Well, Dr. Riesenberger, it's because we couldn't diagnose it back then anyway. So now it's just before people died for unknown causes, and now they know that it was cancer. In light of even those changes, it's still going up, still going up. Now, I'll show you why I believe that this is true. How many of you know what your cholesterol is? <coughs> wow. Now, how many of you do you suppose would have raised your hands in the 1900s? Zero. How many of you know what your cholesterol should be? Wow, a ton of people. How many of you know what saturated fat is? Wow, everybody. Perfect example. I'll tell you one thing from my discipline. In the emergency room, we have protocols. And what would you say the most serious complaint is when you come to the desk? That we, it, like, it sets in motion all of our protocols. I'm having what? I'm having chest pain. There's a reason why when you say chest pain, they go and they hook you up to an EKG, right? They get the IV started right away. They get a chest x-ray. They do a lot of things by protocol. Now, why do you suppose there's such a tight protocol for chest pain? That's right. That's right, because it's the number one killer. More than one-third of an industrialized nation's population will die of heart disease. And so if you're interested in saving lives, then you set all these tight protocols for chest pain. You start talking to people about their cholesterol. You talk to people about decreasing their saturated fat, right? You tell people to change their diets, to decrease the accumulation of plaque in their arteries. There has been a tremendous amount of education about heart attacks, coronary artery disease, strokes, vascular disease. People are becoming informed. And I am fully convinced that one of the most powerful weapons that you and I can use is knowledge. I was just talking to someone out at the break, and I believe that the greatest earthly physician for your life is you. The decisions that you make every day impact your health more than the doctor, more than the nurse, more than your genetics. The decisions you make every day, whether it be diet, whether it be exercise, whether it be a type of dealing with your stress, all of those things are going to affect the way you live and your quality of life. But back to cancer. I believe that you guys, since you've done so well, you probably know what the three deadliest cancers are. Now, when I say deadliest, I don't mean the ones that kill you right away, but I mean the ones that take the most lives every year. What would you say the number one cancer is as far as death? Pancreatic. Meaning numbers. Yes, I heard pancreatic. Pancreatic is deadly. If you get pancreatic cancer, that is a bad cancer to have because it is very difficult to treat. 
but not many people get pancreatic cancer. So what would you say the most killing, like the, the, the cancer that kills the most people every year? Lung cancer. Lung cancer. Okay. Lung cancer. What would you suppose the number one risk factor for lung cancer is? <laughs> you know, it's interesting. You all laugh at that, right? But I think it's very important to note that it wasn't always that way, was it? I can tell you right now is that I can go to the Journal of American Medical Association. Have anyone heard, heard of that journal? It's actually the most popular journal for physicians. It's the largest journal. If you go to JAMA, I can pull you an article from 1935 that recommends smoking as a treatment for asthma. <laughs> you laugh. This is true. This is true. Medical science is not always accurate, right? So I can tell you that we should not pretend to believe we know all the answers. In fact, that was one of the things that caused me to look more closely at something that changed my life. I did not become a Christian until I was a junior in college. And I can tell you that I've had an invitation. Does anyone know where Bastyr University is? Oh, people don't know. Interesting. <laughs> it is the largest naturopathic school in the country. It's in Seattle. And they have recently created an invitation that they want all of their major religions to present an hour lecture on Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jain, Shinto, Tao, all of the religions that are represented in their student body, they would like to come and present. Now, although I'm not a student anymore, I have been given the invitation to represent Seventh-day Adventism, and I am a Seventh-day Adventist. But I can tell you that one of the funny reasons that I became a Seventh-day Adventist was I remember reading something, and it had to do with cigarettes. And I remember reading this thing about, oh, wow, cigarettes are so bad for you. And well, of course, yeah, I know that. It's an insidious poison. It goes on and on and on. It's like a page of all these negative things. But it was in some literature from some Seventh-day Adventist friends they'd given me. And I remember, as I normally do, I, I like to look at references. I'm a physician. I'm sorry. <laughs> because it's very important to know when it was written, right? who it was written by, and who it was sponsored by. <laughs> because I want to make sure there's no conflict of interest and no bias in the studies that I'm reading. So I remember looking at the publishing date, and it was 1870. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> and I started looking at the author. I'm like, this is written in 1870? And the amazing thing to me was not the knowledge that it was proposing, because it was proposing something that was elementary to me. But it was almost 100 years before we as physicians came to the same conclusion. So I bring that out because as I'm going to present something as cutting edge as cancer, just understand that science does not have all the answers. And that is what made me give a second look at Christianity, is because I saw evidence of someone who knew what they were talking about way back when. Now, most of you here today, if I were to say, a vegetarian diet. Would you think that that's positive or negative? Positive. positive. Can you imagine what I would be experiencing if I said that in the 1800s? <laughs> exactly. That's what I would get. I'd get laughter. I'd get mockery. I'd say, oh, not enough protein, not enough iron, no calcium. Da -da 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 -da. But now we know it's true, isn't it? And my question was, as a side note, I, my question was, how do you know that in the 1800s? Then I researched the author, which I like to do too. Because, you know, if somebody does a study on a drug that Pfizer makes, are they a lecturer for Pfizer? Do they receive benefits from that company? So I like to research what they do, what their level of education was. And the author that wrote this about cigarettes, about vegetarian diets, had a third grade education. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. And so I bring that out, confessing humbly before you, I present 
what is what I believe the best evidence and general guidelines that people can follow. But it is by no means the limit. By no means the limit. But with cancer, back to smoking, as you laughed at me with the JAMA article from 1935, which exists. Yes, smoking is the number one cause for lung cancer. We talked about that it increases your risk by sevenfold. And why do you think it caused lung cancer? What's the issue? There are 6,000 chemicals in cigarettes. 6,000. And hundreds of them are what we call carcinogens. Does anyone know what a carcinogen is? Cancer causing. That's right. And the problem is, is that you are bringing a substance into an area of your body that is highly sensitive. And I'll share with you why. Many of you have taken a drug before. Now, if you take it in the form of a pill, let's say, let's say I give you something like Percocet or Valium or Vicodin. You take it, and when is it going to make you sleepy or relieve pain? You take a pill. An hour, maybe half an hour, right? Now, if I give you perhaps a patch with the same medication, put a patch, a transdermal, when will you start to feel the effects? You can, depending on the drug, but it's a little faster, isn't it? Now, if I give you a shot in the muscle, faster yet. Let's say I put something in your IV. And finally, let's say you're in surgery, and the anesthesiologist is looking over you, and he's got a mask that he's going to put on. And he puts on the mask. He says, don't worry. This is just oxygen for now. Start counting backwards. 199. <laughs> when you breathe in a drug, how rapidly does it work? Boom. And that is because the alveoli in your lungs have one cell that separates the lung space from the blood space. It is absorbed almost instantly. And what are you doing with cigarette smoke? right into the bloodstream. And that's why it's so addictive, right? Because what's the addictive component? Nicotine. Nicotine, that's right. You get that feeling almost instantly. In our society, do we like to wait for pleasure? We want instant what? Gratification. Gratification. And that's why it works so well. Because it's not a food, it works even faster. It works within seconds. But that's also another problem because it's highly absorptive. Your body just drinks in what you put into the lungs. Another reason why cigarettes cause cancer is because not only of the chemicals, but because those chemicals actually stay in contact for a long time with the lungs. Has anyone ever noticed that someone who quits smoking, now when they quit smoking, they often complain and say, well, I quit smoking, but now for the, for the last three days I've been doing what? <coughs> Just coughing. And many people who quit will actually complain that their cough gets worse. Now, do you know why that is? If you look at the drug nicotine, it actually has an ability to paralyze the cilia in the lung. Now, the cilia, if you look at the lining of the small bronchioles, which are the little tubes that go down into the recesses of your lungs, there's these small little microscopic hairs that are always doing this. Now, why do you suppose they're always doing that? They clear out particles. They clear out germs when you inhale that fly or something. Trying to get that stuff out of there. The dust, the pollution, right? There's these little hairs that are always fanning upwards until finally they get at the area of your vocal cords where you either do one of two things with it. You cough it up or you swallow it. That's right. 
Now the problem is, is that nicotine paralyzes that mechanism. So what goes into the lungs stays in the lungs. And the problem is not merely contact with a carcinogen, but prolonged exposure to that carcinogen. Because the body is able to pretty much deal with most insults from the environment if you just give it a chance to recover. And so I can tell you that there are many reasons that cigarettes cause lung cancer. But is it just people who smoke who get lung cancer? How do other people who don't even smoke get lung cancer? By what? Oh. Did you know that in many states now, there's a powerful lobby that is trying to close down smoking in bars, in restaurants? It's already done in many states. Now, why do you suppose the bartenders, the waitresses, why do they want to do that? Because they're dying of lung cancer. Did you know that? Did you know that 3,000 people in my country get lung cancer every year from secondhand smoke? Now, I can tell you it is a different magnitude. I mean, some estimate worldwide that you have, of the 400,000 cases of lung cancer from primary smoking, it's approximately 50,000 cases from secondary smoke. And of those, 33,000 die. So that is a reality. And I'll give you an illustration. What would you say the number one cause of asthma in children is? Ah, yes. I've had people come in, they say, no, we had some barbecue this weekend. And little Tommy got a little too close, he got some smoke. And that was the issue. And I say, well, that might have been it. But that's not what the medical literature shows. And I proceed to tell them that the number one cause of pediatric asthma is paternal or maternal smoking. And you know what's amazing is that sometimes people may not quit for themselves, but they'll quit for who? Their child. It's amazing. I've seen people, they're like, Doc, I have been smoking for 50 years. I can't quit. And then when I talk to them about their son, all right, I'll quit. I see people do it. It's amazing. Not always, but sometimes. And I can tell you, if you have a child who has asthma, the reason why it affects a child more than an adult is why, do you suppose? Because they're what? They're smaller. Yeah. I'll give you a great study. They looked at parental smoking, and what would you say the smallest child is? A newborn, right? Newborn baby, less than a few months old. And they looked at the changes and the effects on the baby's lungs. And they found that if you had a parent smoking in a closed room with a baby, for every 20 cigarettes that that parent smokes, it's like the baby smoked nine. Now, obviously, it's not like the baby literally smoked nine adult cigarettes, but it's the same type of effect on them. It is definitely a reality. Let's go to the second most serious cancer. Anyone know what the second leading cause of cancer death is? What kind of cancer? Colon cancer. Very good. Colon cancer. Now, I'm going to show you guys, with the rest of these cancers we're going to talk about, you know what the cause is. And again, if you know the cause, you almost automatically know what? The cure. That's right. Because you remove the cause, just like diabetes, right? What was the cause of diabetes? Fat. Fat. So what do you want to maintain? What do you want to go down to? Ideal what? Body weight. Body weight to cure it. Not all diabetes, right? 95%. So with colon cancer, what would you say the problem is? Diet. Diet. Very good. Does anyone know who Dr. Burkett is? Has anyone ever heard of Burkett's lymphoma? Yes. Burkett was a physician, and he studied colon cancer. 
He actually looked at rates of colon cancer in the United States and then in Africa. And you know what he found out? Is that these tribes in Africa that he was looking at didn't get colon cancer. And he wondered why. And it was diet, you're right. Does anyone know what was abundant in these diets in Africa which became non-existent in America? Fiber. So you guys are all over it. Fantastic. Now why would you suppose fiber would have anything to do with colon cancer? Because fiber, you know, isn't that what they used to call roughage? It just kind of just goes through, right? I mean, no big deal. You don't even need it. How many calories does fiber have? Zero. Zero calories per gram. Because your body doesn't absorb it. So it's kind of like a non-essential, right? Or maybe not. So why do you think diets that are low in fiber would give you an increased risk of colon cancer? Because of? Mm, various answers. I'm going to give you a very powerful illustration. Now obviously the literature is abundant that shows this. In fact, I was just reviewing a study today that showed it's not only high fiber diets, but you can even go with varying amounts of fiber. You can have someone who has the lowest amount of fiber, someone who's a little higher but less than average, average, above average, and highest. And every time you jump up, you reduce your risk of colon cancer. Every time you move up. In fact, between the highest and the lowest, you have a 50% risk reduction just from fiber. In fact, they were looking at some statistics from the National Institutes of Health, and they showed that if people in my country, again, extrapolating to yours, if they just added 12 grams of fiber a day to their diet, they would prevent over 50,000 cases of colon cancer. Do you know what 12 grams of fiber is? That's like everyone eating a bran muffin. I mean, a really big, hearty bran muffin. You believe that? That's like, a, that's like a bowl of all bran. A big bowl. <laughs> but I mean 12 grams of fiber to reduce 50,000 colon cancers. It's incredible. I'm going to share with you how fiber works. But I'm going to also start with what I believe, again, turned me to considering more than just medical science. <coughs> but our original design. If you take a look at a carnivore, a meat eater, right? You can look at its digestive system and you can tell what kind of diet it's going to eat, right? Let's start with the teeth, carnivore's teeth. Fangs, right? Sharp. And then you go down to the stomach. And there is a component in the stomach that is vital for digesting meat. What is it? I heard it. Acid. High levels of hydrochloric acid. Also, you look at the intestines. And do you suppose a carnivore has a long intestine or a short intestine? Short. It's like nine feet, the average carnivore. Then you go to an herbivore. What's an herbivore? It eats plant foods, or a vegan, we would say. And you look at the teeth, and they are what? Flat. Not all flat, right? Not all flat. A horse doesn't have all flat teeth, right? But things that are designed for grinding, right? And when you go to the stomach, what amounts of acid do you find? Do you think it's more hydrochloric acid or less? Less, that's right. You go to the intestine. How long are the intestines in an herbivore? Shorter? Longer? Longer. Absolutely. Now I'm going to share with you what we're like. If you look at our teeth, who do you think they most resemble? 
They're herbivores. If you look at the pH of our stomach, it has 10 times less hydrochloric acid than a carnivore's. And how long are our intestines? Close to 30 feet. And if you understand just looking at our anatomy and physiology, you'll start to see the wisdom in the original diet given to man in the Garden of Eden, which was? It's a vegan diet. A vegan diet. What were we designed for? Plant foods. Now I'll tell you why. What would you suppose is something you need to be careful to refrigerate right away? What kind of foods? Animal products, of course. You don't leave the meat sitting out, right? You don't leave the chicken sitting out because you're going to get what? Salmonella, that's right. You don't leave the mayonnaise out. You don't leave all the animal products you don't leave out. And so the reason for that is this, is because if you put things in a warm, dark, moist place, what happens to it? It spoils. Now, when you eat something, you are placing it in a warm, dark, moist place, <laughs> right? And the thing is, if it's an animal product, you don't want it to stay in there that long. That's why the good Lord designed a carnivore to get the meat in and get it out. <laughs> or some people might even argue that from the beginning they weren't designed to do that, so God allowed them to adapt to eat it. When you have foods and they stay in the gut for long periods of time, what do you think they start to develop? Carcinogens. In fact, they showed that bile salts, does anyone know what bile is? What do you need bile for? What is it used to digest? Fats, right? And most animal products are high in fats, sure. So if you have bile salts, which is what you and I all need to digest fats, and they were exposed to the colon wall for long periods of time. It induced cancer. Now, where does fiber come into all this? Ah. If you had someone like myself, young, healthy male, if I didn't need any fiber, my transit time started to lengthen. I didn't go to the bathroom for a week. I don't know what else is going on there. Maybe I was dehydrated or something. But I can tell you that when you eat a diet that is high in fiber, what happens to your transit time? Well, transit time, for those of you who don't know, is the time when you eat something to when you see it again. <laughs> and you can time your transit time. All you have to do is eat something like a beet, right? Because you can say, OK, I ate this beet. And then you can just keep watching for it. <laughs> and you'll know what your transit time is. And let me just give you a piece of advice. If your transit time's a week, you're getting a lot of carcinogenesis going on down there. Our bodies were designed to move food through so it doesn't just hang out on the colon wall. That's how fiber works. There's soluble fiber. And there's what? Insoluble fiber. Now, the thing that decreases your transit time or moves things through tends to be the insoluble fiber. But soluble fiber is still beneficial. Does anyone know what soluble fiber does? It lowers what? Cholesterol. But that is another lecture. <laughs> third most common cause, third most common cancer, deadliest cancer, I should say, claims the most lives after lung cancer, after colon cancer, is? Breast. breast cancer. Or actually, it's like breast and prostate, if you look at men. Now, I think that's very interesting, because breast, prostate are both cancers related to something. Ah, hormones. That's right. And we'll just talk about breast cancer, just for the sake of time. When a woman has breast cancer, 
What is the first question that we usually want to know as physicians? Well, is it a blank sensitive tumor? An estrogen sensitive tumor. Because many breast cancers are influenced by estrogen, right? That's why they use things like tamoxifen that are anti-estrogens, right? Now the problem was this, is that if you have breast cancer, in fact, I'll tell you right now, one out of eight women right here is going to have breast cancer sometime in their lives. It's very common. It may not be the number one killer, but it's definitely the most common after, of course, what, does anyone know what the most common form of cancer is? Most people don't even think about it. Yes, skin cancer. Skin cancer is the most common, but we usually deal with lung, colon, breast, prostate, things like that. So breast and prostate are the most commonly occurring major cancer, but not the most deadly. But if you have someone with breast cancer, we want to know if it's estrogen sensitive or not. So you already seem to know that it's estrogen, that it's a hormonal type effect. And where would you say that we get a lot of exposure to hormones in our environment? Ah, now why, why would you say that? Why would we get exposure to hormones from animal products? <laughs> because they do. This is true. And you know, it makes perfect sense. It's not just the hormones. I'm going to share with you a very interesting phenomenon. They have found that women who have early menarche, does anyone know what menarche is? Menarche is the first what? Period, a woman has. Women who have early menarche are at higher risk for developing what later? And when, why would that make sense? Longer exposure to estrogen, sure. Now, I'm going to share with you a very intriguing statistic. In the 1800s, specifically in 1850, when they were more rural in societies, when people got married older or later in life? Earlier in life, right? When do you suppose the average age of menarche was? Oh, very interesting. It's not 18. But I'll give you credit because it's 17.25. Isn't that intriguing? I think that's absolutely intriguing. And because when you look at that and you compare it to now, what do you see? What's the average age, would you say, now? 12, maybe even 11, depending on your race. It is much, much younger. And I can tell you that there's a reason for this hormonal abnormality. And I believe you'll be able to guess how it's come about. Because there's been a change in our society. And I'll tell you this, is that an animal will develop more rapidly in response to certain things. If you have, let's say, someone who's a dairy farmer, or someone who's a chicken farmer, right? What do you want those animals to do quickly? Grow, Grow right? Because what does the little chick do for you? It just cheeps and maybe <laughs> smiles at you. But you want it to grow so it can start laying eggs, eggs right? And what does the calf do for you, right? Nothing. Nothing. You want it to grow up so it can start giving milk. milk. So animal husbandry understands this concept. They want to mature their animals quickly so they can start to make a profit. So what do they do? They give them hormones, yes, but does anyone know what else they do? They do give them antibiotics. Very good. I think that's the second one you've gotten. Antibiotics are for twofold. It prevents infection in these animals because if, if you've got someone whose neighbor is just like right here, right? How many more infections do you think you're going to get? A lot more, right? So the antibiotics are to ward off infection, but also to increase maturation. Anything else they do to these animals? What do cows typically eat normally in a normal environment? 
grass. Do they eat that in the animal husbandry business? No. Corn. corn. Hopefully they eat corn. Right. Oh, I think that might have been the same person again. What do they feed them that's a problem? Yes, that's right. In fact, Switzerland won't take any of our beef anymore because we don't have a program to eliminate certain diseases in our cow population. Now, when you take a cow, which is designed to eat grass, right, and you give it more animal products, what component of its diet are you increasing? Carbohydrate, fat, protein. Protein. When you feed any animal large amounts of protein, what do you think it's going to do quicker? grow and develop. And the component in our diet that has increased astronomically is the amount of animal protein that we are consuming. And so now we mature when we're not even ready. Can you imagine the difference between a 17-year-old and an 11-year-old? Not that either is probably ready immediately, right? But I think it's very clear that things have happened in our environment, in our society, that have negatively impacted us. Did you know that, has anyone heard of T. Colin Campbell, author of the China Diet Study? He has actually gone to rural China and examined the age of menarche. And you know what it is? 15 to 18. It's still the same. Because their diets are the same as they were hundreds of years ago. Back to breast cancer. We talked about early maturation. We talked about the increased animal proteins. But I'm going to share with you one tidbit as we close about estrogen. And did you know that an athlete, a female athlete, especially distance athletes, as they begin to run more and more and they become leaner and leaner, what do they lose? Their period. Do you know why they lose their period? Are their ovaries malfunctioning? Are their adrenal glands malfunctioning? Body fat, exactly. When a woman drops below 12% body fat, her period will experience irregularities. Do you know why? Because fat is where you get peripheral conversion of estrogen to an active form. And if you don't have enough body fat, you can't muster enough of the active form of estrogen to produce a period. Now this comes in when we look at the risk of obesity and breast cancer. If you look at a woman who's premenopausal, if she's normal weight, her breast cancer risk is, let's say, one. If she's overweight, meaning above her ideal weight, but less than 20%, it doubles. If she's obese, which means greater than 20% overweight, she triples her risk of breast cancer. Now, if you go to the menopausal woman, that effect changes because you've had exposure to what hormone all your life? Estrogen. But that is accentuated by the fat to this degree. Postmenopausal woman, lean, still, baseline rate, one. Overweight, 500% more. Obese, 1,200% more. It's an exponential relationship. Absolutely. You're right that it is estrogen exposure. But what are the things in our environment that are causing that estrogen exposure? It's not the birth control pill you're taking, principally. It is the fat that we carry that converts that estrogen to this prolonged exposure. It's the animal proteins that we're being bombarded with to the point that we mature five to six years earlier than we're designed to. When you understand the causes of cancer, you'll begin to understand the cure. And I'm going to share one illustration about the immune system. Do you remember what system goes down in diabetics that cause infections? Yeah. Immune system. They have shown increasing amounts of sugar in the diet, even in non-diabetics can decrease the killing power of a white blood cell. Do you know how the immune system kills bacteria? If you look at the immune system, 
It is designed to protect what? Us, protect us. It will eat bacteria, viruses, even a splinter you get caught in your finger. It'll start to fight all of that. Now cancer is the opposite. Because what is cancer? What's the definition of cancer? It's actually a cell that's doing what? Multiplying without respect to other cells. Because when you cut your hand, do your cells multiply? Sure they do, but when do they stop? When they reach another cell, right? They stop. Cancer is something that multiplies without respect to other cells. Cancer cells also produce something called angiogenesis factor. And what do you think that does? That brings blood supply away from its neighbors to where? To itself. Cancer multiplies without respect to its neighbors. It pulls nutrition away from other cells without respect to its neighbors, and it grows and crushes whatever's in its way. Cancer is looking out for who? Itself. And I want you to look at this very carefully. But do you know what cancer eventually will do? Is the cancer will grow to a size where it will now run into a blood vessel like the vena cava. We get something called superior vena cava syndrome where the tumor blocks off that blood vessel. And what eventually happens? You die. But you know what also dies? The cancer. If you understand cancer and the principles of cancer, it illustrates the life of most of us in this world. We're all looking out for what? Number one. And that will lead to death, just like it does for the cancer. Now, the immune system is the contrast. Did you know that if you take any organism, it can just be one cell, one cell, and if you expose it to something that's toxic, do you know what it'll do? Which direction do you think it's going to run? The other direction. But did you know what the immune system does? It fights other bacteria, viruses, things like that. But the way that it fights is actually harmful to itself. It produces chemicals that destroy the bacteria, but it also weakens the white blood cell. And most white blood cells can kill about 14 bacteria before they give up. And when I say give up, do you think they retreat to the lymph nodes? They retreat to the spleen or the bone marrow? Did you know that the immune system fights to the death? It will fight and sacrifice itself for the body. When you look at the two contrasting forces, you can see an illustration of what I believe is the great controversy in this world. You have cancer, which is selfishness. And you have the immune system, which is selflessness. When you understand the two great powers contending for our understanding, for our minds, you'll see that the opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is selfishness. And I can tell you, as I began to see that illustration in the immune system, I began to see a God. I began to see someone who had designed one system in the body to illustrate a life of self-sacrifice that came from one person. And I believe that if you continue to explore that, to study that, whether it is in science or in the Bible, you will find what we were designed for. Tomorrow night, you're going to have an opportunity to begin to understand not only about the physical aspects of the body, but what I believe is so perfectly illustrated by the immune system versus cancer. A life dedicated to serving yourself or a life in giving of yourself on behalf of others. Thank you very much. Okay, any questions? Excuse me, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, regarding uh, prostate cancer. Prostate cancer? That the medical doctor uh, recommend a biopsy, biopsy for prostate cancer. Was that because the PSA was elevated? What, was, what prompted the biopsy? Digital exam?
Okay. Well, if the physician felt something that was like a tumor, he may want a biopsy. Now, normally, if you feel something, most of us would get an imaging study. But, I mean, who knows? Maybe there's a huge tumor or it feels like a rock. And so the physician says, look, even if I see something okay on the ultrasound or CT or whatever they do, they're still going to want a piece of it. Certainly a biopsy is not pleasant of the prostate. But if there's something abnormal there, at least you want to know what it is. And really, the definitive way of diagnosing cancer is a little rhyme that the surgeons all taught us in medical school and residency. If tumor's the rumor, then cancer's the answer and tissue's the issue. <laughs> so you have to get a piece of tissue to find out what the issue is. So if it were me, I would definitely want to see the biopsy. If you don't want to have the biopsy, you could ask the doctor, say, well, could I get some imaging first and avoid the biopsy if it's normal? If he says, look, I don't care what the imaging looks like, something feels really abnormal, you should get the biopsy. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, if you have cancer, you have heard that uh, it's supposed to uh, cut out the meat. And there's another school that says that you also do not take fish. Mm. You know, well, yeah, but because if you have chicken meat, uh, you also have that, uh, you know, the injection. That's what here's the, the here's the issue with fish. Um, there's an entire lecture on fish. Now, I personally don't eat fish. I'm a vegan vegetarian, which means I eat only plant foods. In fact, I am organic vegan with a juicer mm -hmm. at my home. So I'm probably way on this end of the spectrum. But a lot of the reason for that is I know too much. <laughs> So the thing is with fish is this. A lot of fish, if you were to look at all the meats, fish is probably the best of all the meats that are out there. However, what I would say is that the problem with fish is an issue called biomagnification. Does anyone know what biomagnification is? Does anyone know what food chains are, like a food chain? Now, a land-based food chain is usually just three links. It's grass, cow, McDonald's, right? <laughs> Those are the three links in the food chain. But have you ever looked at a sea-based food chain? Do you know how long it is? It's like 14, 15 steps sometimes. If you go from plankton or algae to like krill to whatever, there's various steps in this food chain. And sea-based food chains are much, much larger. And now the problem with that is this is that if you get a small amount of contamination in a water source or anywhere, what tends to happen with the chemicals like DDT, right? You guys have heard of DDT, DDE, other pesticides, things like that. Contaminants are deposited and concentrated in fat. And so if you have one link of the food chain, let's say the amount of contamination is negligible. When you move up to the next one, it is about 10 times as concentrated sometimes. And then it goes up more and more and more and more. And the more links to that food chain, the more concentrated the biomagnification. And so the problem is with a lot of fish is that these fish are carnivorous fish, like trout or tuna or salmon. They're way up on the food chain. So they are receiving a large degree of contamination. And the problem is, is that you don't want that kind of stuff, especially if you're fighting cancer, right? Because if a lot of these products that you're getting from these contaminants are carcinogens, you don't want to add that um, to your diet. You know, there are some people who say, well, the fish has got ikisopentanoic acid, you got the omega-3s, you know, you've heard all that stuff too. But you can get the same nutritional components other places, like flaxseed. Uh, for the omega-3s. So that's the short answer to that. I do not recommend fish for people with cancer. Next question. Um, I, a couple of years ago, I had uterus cancer. And okay. I ended up having a hysterectomy sure. where they took my ovaries and the whole thing. Mm. And I was 68 years old at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, I was, and, but I am overweight, and I know that. But I was wondering, what, did that still increase my chances of getting cancer again? Well, if you have had a hysterectomy, that means your estrogen levels are a little lower. However, since you were probably postmenopausal at the time, your ovaries probably weren't cranking out a tremendous amount of estrogen anyway. So the principal sources of your cancer risk factor 
are still probably going to be uh, the excess weight because, of course, you don't have a uterus to get uterine cancer now, but you still could get breast cancer, right? You could get other forms of cancer. So it certainly entirely eliminates your risk for uterine cancer now that you had the total hysterectomy or ovarian cancer. And that's true that fat, uh, obesity, uh, dietary components do influence uterine cancer and ovarian cancer tremendously. But, you know, still breast cancer is the big one. I mean, uterine cancer, ovarian cancer is, is an issue, but it pales in significance to the amount of breast cancer that we see. So I, for sure, would say you would get tremendous health benefits um, even though you don't necessarily have a uterus or ovaries. This 26, I have my um, ear is taken out. Mm -hmm. They did a biopsy. Mm. Well, did you have a total hysterectomy? No, did you have your ovaries? Have ovaries? Yeah, the real thing that is the issue is the ovaries. Um, if you're left with your ovaries, that's better from the standpoint of symptoms because, you know, you remove the ovaries and you get hot flashes and you basically go into menopause type stuff. So it's more ideal. People also have said, you know, different things with osteoporosis. So it's, if you can avoid taking out the ovaries, it's probably better. As far as risk for breast cancer and things like that, I am not aware of whether taking the uterus out or leaving it in affects breast cancer risk uh, at all. I would think that it's kind of related to other things that you may be doing or not doing. So as far as the uterus, sure, your risk for uterus cancer is zero now. But as far as breast cancer, I think that's unchanged since you still have your ovaries. What kind of cancer? Um, prostate, I believe. Um, are you sure it's not metastasized? Well, okay, keep going. Okay, he was, he was suggesting that, that certain types of diet, and I was just wondering if there's much to that. I've heard this before, that, that if you have a really basic diet, such as grapes or something like that, that, that can be Do you mean basic as far as pH yeah, or simple? PH. You, mean, you mean pH? There's a lot of people who talk about acid base. I personally am not very familiar with acid base. Um, I can tell you that if I personally got cancer, that as far as my diet, I would definitely go raw vegan organic, like right away, and try to get most of my stuff as close to where it's growing as possible. Because what they're finding now is a lot of these compounds, these antioxidants, these isoflavones, resveratrol, quercetin, genistein, all these things that we're just discovering are powerful anti-cancer um, compounds. A lot of these new things that are appearing actually come in to the plant at the moment of getting ripe, like near the end of when it's basically ready to eat. And the problem is, is that if you're far away, like if you're getting some bananas from Brazil or something like that, when do they pick them? Well, they're super green, because otherwise they'll get, you know, spoiled or bruised by the time they get to you. But the problem is, is that a plant is not going to receive anything more, right, at the point when it's picked. The only thing it's going to do is going to take what it's got and convert it to something else. So what I recommend to people is, Ideally, is the nearer the vine, the greater the blessing in the food. If you can actually just take something and just pick it and then eat it, that is the best amount. That's the maximum amount of nutrition you're going to get as long as it's growing in good soil. And there have been a lot of studies done now on organic versus non-organic. I'm definitely for organic, not just from the standpoint of nutrition, but we actually had a study kind of near where I'm living on Mercer Island. Does anyone know where Mercer Island is? And uh, would you say the people there are poor, rich, what? They're mostly rich. So they can afford to get stuff. In fact, their median income is, I think, double. And they did a very intriguing experiment on organic versus non-organic in children ages 3 to 10. And they found that these kids that were just eating a regular diet, and they checked for measurable amounts of pesticides certain types of, um, they're, they're type of nerve, they affect nerve conduction in insects, and that's how they kill them. And they found 
that these um, hydrocarbons when the children were on a regular diet, they could measure them in the urine and the saliva. And within 36 hours of stopping the regular produce and going to organic, they had nothing. And it, when they went back on it, it appeared right away. It's pretty amazing. And so what I tell people is that, yeah, sure, people could argue and say, well, Riesenberger, that amount of pesticide residue, we don't think that that's necessarily harmful. But we know a lot of it's harmful, right? And we know that long-term exposure to a smaller amount is also harmful. So my point is, is that if you can detect it in someone's saliva and urine, why do you want that? You know what I mean? So what I would recommend to someone with cancer is to work with a physician who knows what they're doing as far as medical side of it, but is willing to work with you also in changing your diet and your lifestyle, not just your diet, exercise, the way you handle stress, the way you sleep, amount of water you drink, all kinds of stuff. Is there one more question? Yeah. Okay. Um, you were talking about the uh, comparison or the, the length from estrogen for a woman yes. to breast cancer. What is the length for a man, an obese man, with being fat? Wow. Oh, as far as prostate. Oh, that's a very intriguing. I haven't seen a study done on that, actually. Uh, we do know that women ha who have early menarche uh, or later menopause tend to be at higher risk for breast cancer. And that's what actually someone over here said. They said because it's longer exposure to estrogen. But as far as men and maybe testosterone or other forms of that, I'm not really certain. I don't know if a study uh, has done for that. I do know that obesity does increase cancer risk, but as far as when a guy develops, like in puberty, I don't, I don't ever, I don't, I've never seen a study related to that, but it certainly would be good uh, to look at, because uh, I guess our hormone is more testosterone, and what they're actually finding uh, with testosterone is that as testosterone um, goes down, actually we actually start getting more diseases. The only exception to that is, I don't know if you've noticed heart disease, but women tend to get heart disease, but when, in comparison to men? About 10 years later. And they have postulated that that's because estrogen versus testosterone is more protective for heart disease. Uh, and versus ourselves, we don't have estrogen. Not that I'm recommending you take estrogen <laughs> or anything like that. But I haven't seen a study done on that as far as...